Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture, which is going to be on our fourth theme of the course, Interactions of Europe and the World. Your objective for today's lecture is to explain the causes and the effects of the Crusades and how they changed and challenged Europe during the Middle Ages. So for this thematic for this theme, we're really only going to look at one big topic that took place during the Middle Ages, and that is the Crusades, which is really one of the defining features of the entire medieval period, um, although it primarily took place during the High Middle Ages. However, before the High Middle Ages, we really saw very limited trade and interactions with the rest of the world during the early Middle Ages. As you might remember, this is because the early Middle Ages were, by definition, very isolated. You know, very localized uh, communities based in manners, right, with manorialism, and these manners were mostly self-sufficient. Um, there might be some short-distance trade between manors or villages, but there was very little long-distance trade taking place within Europe or really even between Europe and other parts of the world. There might have been some maritime or sea-based trade in the eastern Mediterranean, maybe between Italy and um, the far eastern Mediterranean or northern, northern Africa, but very, very little, if anything. And the lack of interactions that took place with other parts of the world during the early Middle Ages are, is one of the factors that exacerbated, meaning it made worse, the lack of culture, learning, and intellectual development during that early medieval period. However, the best example of Europe's interactions with other parts of the world, other non-European civilizations, are the Crusades, which are a series of military campaigns or invasions, depending on your perspective, of Christian Europeans against the Seljuk Turks that took place from the 11th to the 13th century. And the purpose of these military campaigns was really, it was an attempt to reclaim and control the Holy Land in the Eastern Mediterranean, what is modern day Israel, Palestine, but especially the city of Jerusalem. So let's explore some of the causes for the Crusades in the 11th century, which again is in the High Middle Ages. One of the most important, and I would say obvious and and really the go-to um, cause of the Crusades would be the threat of Muslim advances into European territory, specifically when the Seljuk Turks took the city of Jerusalem. Now, by the 11th century, Western Europe had emerged as a significant power in its own right, but it still lagged behind other <coughs> Mediterranean civilizations, such as the Byzantine Empire, and the Islamic Empire of the Middle East and North Africa. However, even the Byzantine Empire had recently lost considerable territory in the Eastern Mediterranean region to the invading Seljuk Turks. And the Seljuk Turks were a group that made up part, made up part of that big Islamic Empire, dominating most of the Middle East in this time. So the Muslims had taken control of the Christian Holy Land, which like I said is modern-day Israel and Palestine, and had occupied the city of Jerusalem. Now, the reason Jerusalem is a big deal is because it is considered to be really one of the most holy sites in all of, of Christianity, because this is where Jesus Christ lived mo most of his life, and also where he was entombed. Uh, this city also has very important religious significance for Muslims and Jews as well. Now, Jerusalem had been held by the Byzantines for the past several centuries, um, but just in the 11th century, the Seljuk Turks were able to take control. And again, Jerusalem was a holy city to them as well for different regions, reasons. Now, the Seljuk Turks also posed a considerable threat to the Byzantine Empire in general, which now, because it was really you know, on the decline, needed support from Western Europe. And if the Byzantine Empire fell, then all of Christian European civilization would potentially be threatened by the Turks and the advance of these Islamic empires. All right, another very important cause of the crusade 
are the papal politics taking place? And this is not necessarily the most obvious cause of the crusade, but it definitely was a motivation. The Pope at the time, Urban II, really wanted to reunite Christendom. So let me explain what has just happened. Earlier in the century, in 1054, Christianity had officially been split into separate Western and Eastern churches in an event known as the Great Schism. We will talk more about the Great Schism in our next lecture. This meant that the Byzantine Empire now had their own church, which was called the Eastern Orthodox Church, and, the, and Western Europe was now controlled by the Roman Catholic Church, which was really kind of the original Christian church. This split was the result of centuries of growing cultural differences as well as disagreements in doctrine, so their beliefs and their religious practice as well. Right, so this big, this first big split in Christianity has just taken place. Now, the Byzantine Empire, of course, is under threat. And so the Byzantine Emperor, later in the century, appeals to the Pope in Rome, Pope Urban II, as well as appealing, of course, to fellow Christians, because the Byzantine Emperor needs help to defend his empire against the Seljuk Turks, and also, he wants help so that they can reclaim the Holy Land for Christianity. Well, this is very convenient for Urban II because this plea for assistance presents an opportunity, really, for the papacy and for the Catholic Church. A crusade into the Holy Land to reclaim the city of Jerusalem would increase the prestige of the papacy and also the overall power of the Church in Europe. And the Pope's ultimate goal was to reunite the Western and Eastern churches with, of course, the Pope as the head of the church, right? He wanted to reunite the churches, but really under the Roman Catholic Church. Now, a third contributing factor to the beginning of the Crusades is some of the um, sort of cultural spirit of Europe at the time, such as the extreme religious piety that characterized medieval life, uh, the need for adventure for some of the medieval knights, and also the uh, sort of momentum of European expansion. So Pope Urban II called for the First Crusade in 1095. He promised that all Christians who participated in the crusade would be washed of all of their sins. So if you participate in the crusade, you would, be, you would lose all of your sins, right? All your sins would be forgiven, and you would be well rewarded in the afterlife, you know, the, the, in, in heaven. Now, Pope Urban II aimed this message specifically at knights, medieval knights, who really at this point needed some action and adventure because there were no other major conflicts or campaigns going on in Europe. And also, if we're honest, these medieval knights likely had some sins that they wanted washed away. And medieval knights, who were usually, you know, some type of nobility, maybe lesser nobility, saw the Crusades as an opportunity to win booty, meaning get cool stuff, uh, to get land, and to possibly even get titles and advance their wealth and social position. However, Medieval, in medieval Europe, Christianity, as we know, permeated every aspect of daily life. So this goes beyond just recruiting knights. Um, at this time, pilgrimages, which are like holy journeys to sacred sites like churches or shrines, were very common. Uh, monasteries were full, and there were many, many, many new saints in the Catholic Church. So like Christianity was hopping and popping in Europe right now. And also the idea of sin was especially prevalent. We'll learn more about the emphasis on sin in our next lecture. And so Pope Urban II's promise of immunity from the consequences of sin was very attractive and popular to, to many people in Europe, far beyond the knights. But men, women, even, even younger people and children, kings, nobles, everyone would find some attraction to the Crusades. And the church recruited participants from all across Western Europe using really a propaganda campaign. So Urban II himself 
toured France and preached at cathedrals and churches about the need for Christians to come together and reclaim the Holy Land from the you know from the evil Muslims, um, and again using a lot of propaganda and making the, a big villain of the Muslims. Uh, but also, of course, he is promising all of these spiritual benefits, which to medieval Europeans is really the most attractive part. So here you can see um, a little map of the various religious territories in 1095. So it gives you an idea of, of the geographic layout. So everything in orange, that's the Roman Catholic territory. Everything in yellow, that's your their Byzantine Empire, which as you can see, is a lot smaller than it used to be. And the Eastern Mediterranean, and with the city of Jerusalem right down here, is all controlled by the Seljuk Turks, which are part of the larger Islamic empire at the time. So I'm not going to ex expect you to know, to know about all eight crusades. Um, really the most important thing to know about the crusades are their causes and their effects on Europe. However, I do want to take some time to talk about some of the highlights of the course of the crusades. So ultimately, there were eight campaigns that we consider to be crusades that took place between 1095 and 1270. And these crusades were met with varying degrees of success. So first of all, let's review what were the goals of the crusades. As I mentioned before, everyone saw a reason to participate in the crusades, men, women, children, knights, members of the clergy, nobles, kings, all of these groups would participate in the Crusades. And the original and the ultimate goal of the Crusades was to drive the Turks from the eastern Mediterranean region, right, the area that is modern-day Israel-Palestine, and to recapture this holy land for Christianity, especially the city of Jerusalem. There was also the honest intention of protecting the Byzantine Empire from further Turkish expansion, though, as we know, the real goal in a lot of this was to reunite Christianity under the Roman Catholic Church. So yes, they want to preserve the Byzantine Empire, but the Pope also wants to reunite Christianity. However, even though the Crusaders technically won four times, meaning they recaptured Jerusalem four times, they still ultimately failed in their larger long-term goals. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. So these next examples are not things that are going to be critical for your content knowledge, but again, I consider them to be some of the highlights and more interesting topics of the course of the Crusades. So the first crusade I want to tell you about is actually the Third Crusade which took place in the 12th century. This is sometimes called the King's Crusade because in this crusade, we have the King of France, the King of England, and the Holy Roman Emperor all participating. This also represents a rare alliance between France and England. We might remember are traditionally enemies throughout history, at least until we get to Germany in the 19th century. This was also not a very successful crusade. The Holy Roman Emperor actually drowned in a river en route to Jerusalem. Um, the King of France peaced out after a while, and then the King of England, uh, who was actually Richard I, would eventually be captured and held hostage during the Crusades. And if any of you have ever heard of the story of Robin Hood, or maybe you've seen the um, the, 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 cart, the animated movie where they're the foxes and everything. That's what I always think of as Robin Hood. Or maybe you've seen Men in Tights. Anyways, the story of Robin Hood is set in, during this time in King Richard's absence in England. So there's a little historical context for some fiction that you might be familiar with. The next crusade, I think, is actually more significant in the long run. This is the Fourth Crusade, which took place in the early 13th century. In this crusade, Venice, which was a wealthy Italian city-state, largely funded and controlled the crusade. The real objective of Venice, however, was to weaken the Byzantine Empire so that they could gain control of more Mediterranean trade, especially the valuable luxury goods 
that were coming in from the Middle East and China. So this crusade actually never made it to Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Uh, the Venetians turned their sights on Constantinople and the crusade ended with a direct attack and a sacking of the city of Constantinople where they you know, attacked their, their Christian allies. But again, their intention was to weaken the empire so they could take away more of the lucrative Mediterranean trade. And this action in particular during the Fourth Crusade permanently weakened the Byzantine Empire probably more than any other event that took place over these two centuries. And the Last Crusade is really just more of an interesting story than anything. Uh, this is the Children's Crusade. And this probably is a series of maybe fictitious or misinterpreted events of the year 1212, but still I think you'll find it interesting. The story is that there is an outburst of the original popular enthusiasm for the Crusades, like what we would see in the late 11th century with the First Crusade. And this enthusiasm led to gatherings of children or, or young people, maybe like teenagers in France and Germany. And these children and these youths were seen as more spiritually poor, pure, excuse me, and innocent than their elders and therefore more likely to succeed in this holy quest to reclaim their holy land. Ultimately, about 37,000 children and youths left France and Germany to help the crusaders in the holy land. However, none of these children actually reached the holy land. They were either sold as slaves or they settled along the route to Jerusalem. Basically, they peaced out and made their life elsewhere or they died of hunger during the journey because uh, it turns out that children do not make good soldiers, especially in a holy war. Uh, here is a map to show you kind of an overview of the various crusade routes, right? Uh, you can see some crusades went overland, some crusades went um, by the sea. We call that sort of a maritime crusade, right, with ships and everything. You can see the fourth crusade with Venice, that yellow uh, sort of orange line there, went straight from Venice to Constantinople, never actually made it down to Jerusalem. So this is a good visual for you to help to, for, to help you understand the pattern of crusades and where they came from and um, the, the, the routes that they took. But really the most important slide here I think are the consequences of the crusade which we're going to see now. So really what were the effects of the crusades on Europe, how did they change Europe? That's what you want to consider as we're looking at this slide. So one of the um, more immediate effects of the Crusades is a considerable increase in papal power. So despite the outcome of a Muslim victory, because as we know the Christians would lose and the Muslims would win in the long run, many argue <clears throat> that the Crusades successfully extended the reach of Christianity and Western civilization. In particular, the Roman Catholic Church experienced a vast increase in wealth. Many crusaders, successful crusaders who came back with the spoils of war would often uh, donate a portion of their, their wealth and their, their, their booty from the, from, the, from, the, from the war to the church. So the church became wealthier and therefore more powerful, and the power of the pope became even more elevated <clears throat> after the crusades ended. In fact, from about the, the 13th to the 16th centuries, this period is considered to be the political peak of the papacy, where the Pope is more powerful than he will be at any point in history. We get to that point where like, the Pope is the king of kings in Europe. Another consequence of the Crusades was the beginning of European territorial expansion. And this is a theme that we will see continue into Unit 1 and really throughout much of the modern era. The Crusades laid the foundation for the emergence of European countries in the next era, the modern era, to be powerful forces on their way to eventually controlling most other areas of the world. We would see this in future military campaigns that we might also consider Crusades, like the Reconquista or the Reconquest of Spain in the 15th century, and even the conquest of the Americas in the 16th century. 
The Crusades also introduced vast cult new cultural horizons for many Europeans, right? This new exposure to new cultures. Um, successful Crusaders brought back luxuries from Eastern civilizations that uh, upper class Europeans coveted, meaning they wanted that. It also brought Europeans in contact with classical knowledge and classical learning that had been lost to Europe for much of the early medieval period. And it even introduced them to new technology from some of these Islamic empires. As a result, in the centuries following the Crusades, there was a heightened interest in travel and also in classical learning throughout Europe, especially in the more urbanized areas like Italy. And this may have helped to pave the way for the Renaissance, which would begin in the 14th and 15th centuries. Now, the Crusades also contributed to the decline of medieval institutions, which is interesting because we associate it so much with the church and it's such a important and defining event of the Middle Ages, but yet it contributed to the decline in some ways. Well, the Crusades actually contributed to the decline of the feudal aristocracy and gave more political power to kings and to the merchant class. And feudalism and manorialism began to lose some of their significance. Again, this is a very slow and gradual process that takes several centuries. But kings are becoming more powerful and are able to consolidate their power and expand their kingdoms by getting more land. One of the ways they did this is because nobles might leave to fight in the Crusades, and some of them never came back, which allowed local kings to seize their lands and therefore expand their kingdoms and become more powerful. Also, there's a significant increase in the size and the influence of the merchant class. So these are like merchants, people who, whose occupation is defined by trade. Think of them more like businessmen. They tend to live in towns and cities. And so with the increase of the merchant class, we also see an increase in towns and cities. And these groups were not connected to manorialism and feudalism. For example, the Italian city-states, places like Venice and Genoa and Florence and Pisa, and their merchant classes became much wealthier and more powerful in the centuries following the Crusades. And this wealth is, and, and ultimately their lack of, uh, the, the, the lack of feudalism that took place in Italy and those restrictions that come with it are what, some of the reasons why the Renaissance would begin in Italy. But we will learn much more about that particular topic in our next unit. And the last consequence of the crusade, which I think we can still see the effects of as late as the 20th and 21st century, is the legacy of Muslim and Christian conflict that it will establish. Now we know that the Muslims would win. The Seljuk Turks ultimately defeated the Christians and permanently recaptured Jerusalem in 1291. The crusades had also caused a fatal weakening of the Byzantine Empire. Some of that, of course, was the fault of other Christians like the Venetians. And just two centuries later, the city of Constantinople would fall to a new group known as the Ottoman Turks, also part of this Islamic empire, and it would bring an end to the thousand years of the Byzantine Empire. Now, I've mentioned this before, but the fall of Constantinople would send shockwaves across Europe. And it would also open the door for further Muslim expansion into the continent of Europe in the 16th century, which becomes a major uh, you know, political issue for the kings and rulers of the 16th century. And we'll learn more about that in a later unit. Also, we have to consider the crusade from the perspective of Muslims, right, um, who at many times were victims. Muslims viewed these European crusaders and therefore most Europeans in general, as immoral, bloody, and savage. Uh, the ruthless and widespread massacre of Muslims, Jews, and non-Christians that took place during the Crusades resulted in bitter resentment and mistrust of Europeans' 
that would last for centuries. And again, I think we can continue to see that mistrust, that resentment, that conflict between the Muslim regions of the world and the Western regions of the world as late as our modern day life. So that is the end of our lecture. This one was fairly short. Please remember to do your write-up and tune in for our next lecture, 0.5, Cultural and Intellectual Trends of Europe. Enjoy the rest of your day.